overview of what happened in the last 30 years, um, but it will shed light on some key patterns and events um, that can illuminate our understanding of the past in order to carve out the best possible transitional justice approach suitable for the particular needs of this region at this time. The Ethiopian state has displayed a degree of willingness to address the question of past human rights abuses through both punitive and non-punitive ways. In that regard, it is worth exploring the limitations, challenges, and opportunities in doing transitional justice amidst the current political climate. So establishing the context of the early 90s um, is key to understanding what led to the large-scale abuses committed in the last few decades in the region. As the scope of this paper is limited to examining the abuse of the last 30 years. Uh, so leading up to the 1992 elections in the Somali region, following the establishment of the regional state, uh, the region became the center point for political competition and political rivalry. In order to undermine the progress um, of the ONLF at the time, the Ogaden National Liberation Front, um, the TPLF attempted to convince key ONLF figures as well as traditional elders to alter the liberatory goals of the organization centered upon self-determination. In doing so, up to 14 clan-oriented proxy political parties were created by Melazanawi in order to succeed against the ONLF in the elections. In 1992, when the ONLF officially opened its offices, their buildings and leaders were routinely attacked and intimidated. This was the same time that saw a rise in the enforced disappearances of key persons. None have been found until this very day. When the ONLF called to trigger Article 39 in 1994, the chairman, Sheikh Ibrahim Abdullah, was attacked in Warder, where up to 80 people were killed. Meanwhile, ONLF officers were attacked and official war was waged against the group. On April 20th, 1994, the group responded by declaring to vacate their posts in government and defend themselves by armed struggle against the government. The armed insurgency, which began in 1994, continued until 2018. So just a remark on um, focusing on the last 27 years. Um, the reason why we've chosen the last um, few decades is because it is the most recent um, and immediate experience um, of the people that we are interested in. But we know that past atrocities span further than the past three decades. From the Somali perspective, it can be traced as far back as the creation of the modern state or the invention of the modern state, um, to use Professor Bonnie's term. Regardless, regardless of political arrangement, be it monarchical rule, military dictatorship, or ethnic federalism, state interactions with the Somali periphery, shaped by violence, have more or less remained the same. The cycle has been one of state violence, resistance, insurgency, counterinsurgency, and mass atrocities. I think uh, an, interesting, an interesting meeting which occurred between Mahtal Dahir, liberation leader um, from the Somali region, an encounter between him and Haile Selassie um, illustrates this sense of continuity. Um, when he was released from prison after spending about 11 to 12 years in prison, Haile Selassie called him and he was with a group of ministers and he, uh, he asked him, you know, have, have you cooled down now? Um, referring to his activities, his rebellions previously. Uh, Mahtal did not answer directly, um, but Haile Selassie responded saying, do you know that the crime you've committed, um, you know, the punishment for the crime you committed is death? So Mahtal Zahir responses, did I... Did we make the law? So you speak of, you, you say that the punishment for what I've done is, um, is murder, but did we make the law? And Haile Selassie responded, what do you mean by, did you make the law? And he responds, Mahtal Tahir then responded, you came to, you did not consult us with regard to the laws that you're using to govern the region, and we did not sign any agreement. You captured us by force. And we had no say in, in the current system. And this echoes, what Professor John Rakakis was saying yesterday, that the vast majority of the population in this country are not loyal to a system that they had no say in creating. A similar incident um, which features in the historical memory of the um, average Somali is 1961 Degahpur, when a group of youth um, wrote a letter to the, um, the, the, the military chief sta stationed um, in the town at the time requesting for rights uh, and for self-determination. The very next day, um, a large number of um, military came from Jigjiga, entered into Degapur and killed 72 people because of that single letter that was written by those youth requesting um, rights. So uh, collective punishment methods um, against 
or rather counterinsurgency methods used against Makht al-Dahir's own liberation movement um, during the 60s mirrors the exact same methods used by um, um, forces operating um, inside the Somali region in the last few decades. So current grievances can be described as an accumulation of past grievances retold and relived through collective historical memory. This form of continuity in historical injustices further complicates any attempt to limit the scope of our period of focus, but also the period of focus of any transitional justice initiative. Uh, a key example that um, I want to refer to is the post-Abale period in 2007, which marked a defining moment uh, when it comes to serious abuses committed in the Somali region. It was a turning point which saw state-sanctioned violence exacerbate. In April 2007, ONLF's offensive against an oil exploration, uh, exp exploration facility um, was uh, responded with a subsequent scorched earth campaign against the region. The banning of international organizations, including international media, a full-fledged economic embargo, and a record number of human rights violations committed by the federal forces and the Liu police. This marked a dark new chapter in the state-led counterinsurgency campaign against the Somalis. The campaign took a new turn when the Liu police was created in 2009, a specialized paramilitary force created to dismantle and destroy lives and livelihoods in the fight against the ONLF, where the population was held collectively responsible. So the following are some key examples of uh, serious rights abuses that are the most difficult to address based on um, the responses that we've received and um, based on um, my experience speaking to people and um, staying in Jigjiga for a few months, for the past few months. Rape, is the mo rape and sexual violence is the most common one. Uh, sexual violence and rape was committed with impunity by security forces. It wasn't just a consequence of war or conflict, but rather a deliberate counterinsurgency strategy used as a combat tool. Used in prison centers, in underground uh, detention facilities, in military barracks, and pretty much everywhere. The degree of trauma associated with such violence is understandably hidden and therefore most difficult to deal with. Land grabbing. In the Somali region, displacement, dispossession, heavy taxation, land grabbing, and forceful evictions from ancestral homelands are also rights abuses whose consequences will need to be addressed as part of a transitional justice framework. Nomadic people have been denied the use of important and indigenous pasture land at the arrival of international corporations. When a company decides to explore for oil, or any other natural resource, the army closes off large tracts of land and prevents pastoralists access to the grazing land and watering points. This is still the ca a case in point um, during time. This is um, particularly dangerous during times of drought and extreme climatic changes in the precarious ecology of the region. Forceful evictions are also, also linked to this and the disruption, this, the disruption of traditional nomadic ways of life. The demolishing of properties, land sold and resold, forcefully taken by officers with impunity and sometimes by the state. These are some of the examples that I've seen victims trying to deal with as we speak right now. Um, and it's just so difficult um, for the courts to manage um, or for the institutions currently in place to manage. Another key point is mass unlawful imprisonment. Uh, the disposal of Abdi Ile has seen the release of all political prisoners in the Somali region. While there isn't a set figure of former political prisoners currently, you know, on the outside attempting to reintegrate into society, the experiences of prisoners, many of whom have incurred serious lifelong injuries, is a widespread societal issue. So, just some points now on um, transitional justice uh, challenges and opportunities relating to um, some mechanisms. Uh, following the appointment of uh, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed, a series of changes have occurred in the country. Uh, for the Somali region in particular, the disposal of Abdi Ilay, the longest serving president of the region, marked a positive turn in the region's history. His reign was characterized by violence and terror, which permeated every aspect of society and life. The region was host to hundreds of thousands of political prisoners, victims of widespread rape and torture, Countless were forcibly displaced, while others had their properties and livestock confiscated. 
The challenges in addressing this inherited new context are many, yet the new, ad new administration has taken a number of key initial steps towards initiating transitional justice. It's centered upon providing the most meaningful justice possible in the political conditions of that specific time, usually following a period of serious rights violations. Due to the fragility of the political context at hand and the sheer breadth and depth of abuses, it is increasingly difficult to address every type of violation or all previous crimes committed. This is a key challenge in the Somali region. Complex issues such as large-scale land and property expropriation are a case in point. So I'm just going to go over four key points, um, mechanisms of transi transitional justice and some of the issues relating to each. So criminal prosecutions. There are a number of different institutions directly implicated, directly or indirectly implicated in human rights abuses in the Somali region, including federal level security institutions. There is neither the capacity nor the necessary political will to prosecute at least the most responsible for the serious crimes. If it is not possible to prosecute all criminals and instead some are arrested based on evidence of crimes committed, other criminals will likely continue to serve in their roles and this has caused widespread grievance among Somalis. It has also been regarded as selective justice where when victims see their perpetrator continue to live their life as normal and it has also led to cases of victims taking justice into their own hands. Moreover, the question remains of whether or not we are um, really truly deterring future crimes um, if we only target the masterminds and not those who fulfill those orders, so kind of mid-level um, officers. In the Somali region, there's also a serious concern about the, the government, so the state, um, at the state level, the government's willingness to prosecute the highest officials from key security and intelligence institutions who are directly responsible for designing and executing the violent policies in the Somali region over the past few decades. Charging Abdi Ile with the crimes committed on August 4th alone, for example, sends a very dangerous message to Somalis that the Abdi Ile will not be held accountable for the crimes he committed while he was the head of head of security in the Somali region, and then during his term as president. It shows that the policies he was fulfilling were state-sanctioned and therefore unworthy of redress. Thus, what is termed subject matter jurisdiction and what type of crime should be prosecuted and who the crime was committed against to determine prosecutorial action is deeply problematic. So because we're running out of time, I'm just going to um, mentioned that the other three points are truth-seeking, um, the issues around re-traumatization, reparations, the individual, uh, which takes the form of the individual, the collective, the material, and the problems associated with reforms of laws and institutions that were designed um, to commit or designed to promote impunity when it comes to human rights violations. I'm not going to um, delve into the methodology of the findings, but just some concluding remarks. Um, a, Somali region, a Somali region transitional justice, of justice approach would first need to determine the depth and extent of abuse to, to decide on the best course of action. And this should be based on what people or what the victims would like to see done. The possible tensions between Western jurisprudence versus traditional justice mechanisms will likely present challenges in terms of determining the best way forward. Nonetheless, employing multiple methods may address this issue, since one mechanism isn't necessarily enough. Multiple complementary methods um, which re redress serious violations, both at the individual and societal level, is key. There is an interesting opening here in the Somali region under the new administration to do transitional justice correctly, while striking the balance between justice and reconciliation. Uh, things will not take care of themselves. I think that's a really important uh, message to remember. Um, as peoples and societies do not necessarily learn from past mistakes, I think world events have shown um, that grave atrocities reoccur um, even in the same context despite large-scale suffering, so things, something has to be done. Um, normalization of serious abuses in the region must end. Uh, putting in place moral parameters and the institutional setup to prevent reoccurrence is an important step, maybe an important first step. Um, part of this is enacting meaningful structural change um, which overhauls the relation of domination which characterizes state Somali relation or has historically characterized state Somali relations. 
The Somali region cannot simply rely on the goodwill of good leaders. There is currently much hope and trust placed in Mustafa, President Mustafa's moral standing with regard to human rights. But as mentioned, this is simply not enough to prevent reoccurrence. Violence continuously reoccurs because there's a lack of accountability. And I think that's really important to remember. In there is a lack, there's a lack of accountability, which is why violence reoccurs and individual pain is glossed over. For the Somali region, there's an opening to not only address past crimes by, by alleviating grievances and current suffering, but to build the type of systems that will prevent, um, or rather that will preserve rights and liberties and in the future. Thank you. <laughs>